Let's take a second and more detailed look at how the quantum matrix inversion protocol works. So we have to start with state preparation. And first and foremost, we have to prepare this B state from the B vector that we had in the original equation that we wanted to solve. Well, this can be a deep circuit, we don't know, but in principle, this can be done. And then to encode A, we use Hamiltonian simulation. So this is one of the early results of quantum computing that yes, this can be done on a quantum computer, but there are terms and conditions that apply. So in this original formalism of quantum matrix inversion, this matrix has to be sparse and well conditioned. So sparse means that it does not have many non-zero entries and well conditioned means that it doesn't have vanishing eigenvalues. So the ratio of the, of the biggest and the smallest eigenvalue is well behaved. It's not, it's not crazy. And if this A matrix is not Hermitian, then you can easily embed it into a matrix that's twice its size in, in either direction. And then say the lower diagonal on uh, the lower anti-diagonal would be A and the upper anti-diagonal element would be uh, the complex conjugate transpose of, uh, of A. And this matrix is definitely Hermitian. So in principle, this could be used for Hamiltonian simulation. Now, the second step is, is quantum phase estimation, which we explained in, in, uh, in much detail. So it, inside it's a quantum Fourier transformation, and then you have these controlled unitary applications. So this is where the simulation of A comes in as a Hamiltonian. The next step is to do a conditional rotation. And, and this is uh, really the, perhaps the most difficult step in understanding how it works. So we added one and still a bit. So after, after the, uh, the inverse quantum Fourier transformation, uh, on the main register where, where, the, where the B state was, so now this psi is actually B, this is again just the B vector. And now in this eigenvalue register, we have an estimate of the eigenvalue. So this would be the eigenvalue register to some finite and precision that we decide like how many qubits we want to use to represent this estimated phase. Once we have this state, we can apply some bit operations to actually get the inverse of this. And once we have that, we add this ancilla. So that ancilla would be in the zero state. And we apply a conditional rotation on this. And we do this to create this superposition in the, in the ancilla qubit. So the rest of the state is, is the same, but we change the, the ancilla uh, qubit with, uh, with the conditional rotation into this one. And the reason we want to do this is because here, the inverse of lambda i appears. And if we have that, then we can start estimating the inverse of the operator with some rejection sampling. So this is also kind of um, an amplitude encoding. We encoded the information we are interested in in the amplitude of the excited state of the ancillary qubit. But before we can start pulling out this, uh, this probability amplitude and estimating it, we have to uncompute everything we've done on all the registers except the ancilla. The reason we have to do this is because we, if you just start rejection sampling here, then all of these qubits are still entangled. So it would end up here with some, with some strange mixed state if you just trace out a part of the system. So to avoid that, we have to uncorrelate the rest of the registers. And the way to do it is to uncompute, to inverse every single step we do, we've done so far, except the conditional rotation, which created our desired uh, state. So once we do this, uh, first of all, our, our circuit is immediately twice as deep as it was. But it, once we do that, we can do this rejection sampling on this. So once we measure the ancillary register and we get one, we know that uh, the, the probability of that is proportional to the inverse of uh, lambda i. And with that, we can start estimating observables uh, in, the, in the solution of this. This is not minus one, this is minus one. In the solution of this uh, um, linear equation. That's the essence of it. And if you accept that this algorithm has a, has a very, very large um, resource requirements and 
you meet all the conditions that are required to run this protocol, then this protocol can give, uh, can give you an exponentially faster way of calculating or estimating the, the solution of this linear equation.